For our five-year anniversary, my wife and I decided to make a trip to Japan. We were always passionate about the culture. In fact, when we first met, we bonded over that mutual interest. After a week or so of planning, we had made arrangements to spend three days over in the Yamanashi Prefecture, a countryside area right next to Mount Fuji. We flew over to Tokyo, took a train over to Fujiyoshida City, and from there a taxi to Narasawa Village, where we would be staying. During the train ride, my wife asked me if I wanted to visit Aokigahara, which at the time I had never heard of. She explained that it was a forest at the base of Mount Fuji, famous for being one of the most popular spots for suicide in Japan. The whole suicide thing kind of freaked me out, but I went along with it since it was smack dab on her face that she really wanted to go there. We stayed at a local ryokin, a traditional Japanese style inn with natural hot spring baths, traditional tatami rooms with futons instead of beds, the whole thing. In these inns, customers usually get one waitress assigned to them at all times meaning in the time you'll spend there, you'll usually only interact with one waitress. We got the head waitress assigned to us, since she could speak a bit of English, and so could communicate better with us. The day we got there we were exhausted, so we spent most of the afternoon in our room just resting. A bit before sunset we took a walk around the block, fascinated by the contrast of old styled houses and modern utilities like vending machines and ATMs. Not far from where we were, there was a lookout point that looked like it had a great view of the entire area, from Mount Fuji down to Psycho Lake. My wife got all excited with the discovery and asked to go there. I wanted to tell her that we'd go there the next day, since I was so tired and just wanted dinner and sleep. But when you look at your lover's pleading face at sunset, you just can't bring yourself to refuse their wishes. When we got up there, the twilight had already turned into pure night. Like we thought, the view was great. We could see a big chunk of the countryside Japan we loved so much. And standing there with her, just enjoying the scenery was an amazing moment for me. One of the dominant features of this view was Aokigahara which had its contours illuminated by small buildings and roadside lamp posts, but grew darker the further inward you looked. It was at that moment I noticed that I was spinning around in place, getting a good look at every single nook and cranny, but my wife wouldn't take her eyes off of the forest. Jokingly, I told her to snap out of it, but her face remained serene yet almost melancholic. She quickly turned towards me and said, Let's go to Aokigahara right now. This time I couldn't fulfill her wish. It was dark out. I was tired and the thought of going inside of a forest famous for suicides wasn't sitting well with me. She kept insisting and I kept refusing. Until it got to the point where we were both walking back towards the Ryokin in a sour mood. Some Ryokin have an outdoor hot spring bath per room but the one we were staying in was the more traditional kind, with a common male bath and a common female one. Still bitter about what had happened earlier, I told my wife I'd go and take a bath before dinner, and suggested that she should do the same. She agreed, and we each went into our respective baths. About half an hour later, I went back to our room and she wasn't there. I assumed she was still in the bath but not long after, the head maid came in and gave me a neatly folded piece of paper. In faulty but understandable English, she explained that my wife had given her instructions to deliver me that note when I got back from my bath. It read, I went there anyways. I rushed outside, mad but worried. Despite the whole scary suicide forest thing, a real concern was that she was alone at night in a country we only knew from an outside perspective. It wasn't difficult to make your way towards Aokigahara, 
since there were signs all over the streets pointing you there, but it was still around a 30 minute walk from the end we were at. Running with a cause, I got to the first wall of big trees that marked the entrance to the forest in about 15 minutes. I admit it took all I had to muster up enough courage to enter Aokigahara, but I did it bent on finding my wife. One thing I didn't know at the time was that it was common for people who were planning to commit suicide inside the forest to tie a rope to a tree near the entrance and drag it along with them the deeper they went inside. This was so that if the person had second thoughts, they could find their way out of the maze-like forest. In this haunting and claustrophobic environment, with nothing but my phone as a light source, seeing all the different ropes twisting and intertwining in every direction that could very well lead to a corpse, with the occasional abandoned set of camping equipment tossed around the floor, was the most frightening thing I had ever seen. There are frequent searches made by the local police and volunteers to get the dead bodies out of the forest. I found out firsthand how they discover said bodies, following the ropes and the rotten smell. Getting deeper and deeper into Aokigahara, I came across hung bodies lightly swaying in the tree branches and decomposing bodies inside destroyed tents. The thick air was suffocating, the light dim enough to make you second guess your eyes, and the smell. I puked as I came across the third body I found. The putrid stench combined with the fear got the better of me. There was no way of telling if I was close to her. I was just going in random directions, scared to even shout her name. But then I heard leaves cracking somewhere to my left and slowly followed the sound. What I found was a rope, one end tied to a nearby tree and the other end merged with the darkness further inside the forest. It was twisting and turning like someone was pulling it from the other side which meant someone was at the other end of this rope, and it could very likely be her. Another thing I didn't know at the time about Aokigahara was that since long ago it has been a very spiritual place. Following this rope that very well represented my hope and guide light, I somehow felt a bit safer and relieved, like she just had to be on the other end. At this point, the deeper I went, the less corpses I found. I was so deep inside the forest, I had reached the point where everyone that came here had already done the deed or had a change of heart. The rope was getting steadier, like I was close to the end of it, and that's when the voice appeared. I thought you loved me. You said we were meant to be. Was I not good enough? How could you do this to me? From the trees, from the air, from my mind, from everywhere, her voice taunting me, accusing me. I hastened my pace now, even more anxious to find her, to apologize to her. I knew all along, I thought you'd stop. I was now sprinting towards the end of the rope. I could finally make up a human silhouette on the far out darkness. Getting closer, I could say for sure that it was her, but she was not alone. In Japanese folklore, Shinigami or death gods are usually depicted as disfigured, mutilated white beings with humanoid faces, often carrying a bladed object like a knife or a scythe akin to those shown in western portrayals of the Grim Reaper. The creature in front of me, grabbing my wife by her hair with its rotten, cracked hands, was just like the ones I had seen in books. The fear and shock made it hard to realize at first, but all that it was grabbing was her head. The rest of my wife was at the creature's feet, cut clean at the neck. It started walking towards me, still holding her head, in contorted, painful-looking steps. Grabbing the rope I used to get there, I ran back as fast as I could, like my life depended on it. I'm sure at that time, it really did. When I got out of the forest still in shock, I desperately tried to ask for help to whomever I came across on the roads. The language barrier was too strong, but they could see I was frightened 
and in panic so they called the police. Turns out that the only person who spoke even a bit of English in the village was the head maid, so the police went and got her so she could translate for me. Now a bit calmer, due to pure exhaustion, I was able to explain to her what had happened and what I had seen. The look on her face as she heard me was difficult to understand. She turned to the police officers and other random folk that were surrounding me and said something to them in Japanese. They all got the same look on their face and talked amongst themselves. Finally, she turned towards me and said, We don't talk about it. We leave it alone. The local police reported the case as just another suicide. I couldn't explain to our family and friends what had really happened. From that day onward, even during her funeral, I had to pretend that she committed suicide in Aoki Gahara, like so many others did, but I never understood why I heard those voices inside the forest. For three months, I just assumed it was a fear-induced hallucination, but just this morning, as I was cleaning my living room, I found a letter behind a framed picture of us. It was a suicide note that started with the sentence, I know you cheated on me. I was having problems sleeping and was going through Kana Shibari almost every night. I think a lot of it had to do with moving out of my old apartment and moving into this one. I wanted to stay at a more upscale place so I could bring my friends over. There was nothing wrong with my new place except for the Kana Shibari. Kana Shibari is a phenomenon where your body won't move. It's quite common in Japan where many Japanese people have said to experience this. It is said to be caused by the supernatural. It got worse and I realized that every time I felt my body going numb, I could see someone standing in the corner of the room. When it's happening I can't move or talk, so I just move my eyes to glance over to the corner. It's a man and he's not someone from this world. He seems quite content though, just standing and staring. At first I was annoyed and scared of this ghost, but I realized he didn't really do anything. He just causes Kanashibari and stares. In no time, I usually fall back to sleep and wake up the next day. I thought he was harmless until months had passed by. My body was weak and I was losing weight because of loss of appetite. My hair was starting to thin out and I always had dark circles under my eyes. When I went back home for a weekend, my mother made me go to the hospital. The doctors couldn't find anything wrong, so I told her about the ghost that lives in my new apartment. She was furious. We went to a temple together and talked to a monk about it. He told me to pray during my Kana Shabari in my head, instead of thinking about how to go back to sleep. When I went back to my apartment, I felt a chill. I felt like something was angry that I left for a few days. Before, this ghost wasn't much of a threat, but I soon realized that it might be something more than a man's ghost. That night, it happened again. As soon as my body couldn't move, I saw him in the corner of the room. I assumed that he would stay in the corner as always, but it turns out that I was wrong. It took a step, then another. When he was close enough, I could see his face. Holy shit. There was something very disturbing about his face. It was way past angry. More like an insane frenzy going on in his head. I started to pray, and I prayed as fast as I could. It seemed to notice I was praying. It started to twist its face and let out a big scream like it was in pain. After a minute, he was gone. I kept praying for a few minutes, but I soon realized everything was okay. And then I heard, Do you think praying helps? The words came from under the bed. The next morning, I moved back into my mom's house. I'm never going back there again.
My younger brother refuses to talk about it, but somehow the subject gets broached once a year. Typically around the family holidays when we see each other again. As adults, it's just something you never forget. Even when you think you've forgotten it. The idea, the image, the senses tend to creep up on you in your dreams, or sometimes your nightmares. We don't even discuss it with our families, our spouses, or even our parents. It's just a secret we've kept between the two of us. Years ago, when I was 13 and my brother was 12, we lived on a military installation in Japan. It was an enclosed base, so entry was only permitted to those who worked or lived inside. The base was previously garrisoned by the Japanese and turned over to the Americans after World War II. So as kids, we would often hear rumors about hidden crevices or caves on the base that still had Japanese skeletons or memorabilia from the war. We lived near the sea wall, which pretty much ran the entire length of one side of the installation. Behind our quarters, there were two exceptionally large hills. I'm talking about hills that were fairly high and steep. You could grab a piece of cardboard and slide down with it. Most of the kids would take their BMX bikes and ride down trying to avoid the metal fences of the houses below. Also, these hills were popular meeting spots for whatever. Some would meet up to chat, make out with their significant others, or just hang around and watch the lights of the cars pass by on the adjacent roads. One hill, about two blocks behind our house, was incredibly large and high, somewhere around 50 feet or more, and jutted out from underneath the old military police station, which was on a higher level and fenced all the way around. The other side of the hill was covered with trees and dirt, plus a small crevice or cave which small children can easily climb through. One summer night, a couple of the neighborhood kids decided to sneak out in the middle of the night to meet up on the larger hill. We were just going to hang out and chill with each other before summer vacation ended and we were all back to school. That evening, my brother and I waited until our mother fell asleep. And when she did, she was practically comatose. Nothing could wake her up, even the sound of thunder. After 1 a.m., we headed out through the front door and made our way towards the larger hill out back. What I clearly remember about the evening was that it was unusually still and quiet. No sounds, not even the buzz of the cicadas murmured in the air. There was no wind and few streetlights that illuminated the dark rows of military housing leading towards the hill. Everything just seemed unnaturally quiet. As my brother and I approached the hill, we looked up and called out to see if any of our other friends, mostly neighborhood kids, had made it. Nothing, just silence. Since this hill was rather steep, it made running up the hill a little difficult. So we slowly made our way up to the top and stopped as soon as we neared the edge. I reached the hill first, with my brother coming up behind me. What we saw completely made us stop in our tracks. About 20 feet away from us we spotted a person on the hill. The figure was tall, and from what I could see, a male. What was odd about this person was that they were lying completely still on the grass and almost seemed to be faintly illuminated by some kind of light. There were no street lamps tall enough to cast its light on top of the hill due to its height. So I still can't explain why the figure seemed to stand out against the darkness. What was even more unsettling was the fact that the entire figure was eerily emitting a soft, deathly sort of white color. The head, arms, legs, and feet were all white. Just white. Who's that? my brother asked behind me. I don't know, was what I remembered answering before turning back to the figure. As we stared, we didn't dare come closer 
because we instinctively knew that something was off with this person. It didn't seem opaque or transparent like a ghost, but rather solid and with substance like a real person. In fact, it appeared to be a man. Except for that soft white color that seemed to pop out of the darkness, the figure continued to lie still on the grass, with its arms lying at its sides. As I took one faltering step forward, I paused. It moved so fast that I jumped back and bumped into my brother, who almost lost his balance and would have tumbled down the side of the hill if I hadn't held on to his arm. The person shot up from its waist into an upright position without the use of its arms. It sort of reminded me of a stiff board. I mean, the movement wasn't natural. There was no use of hands or feet to guide it into that position. And that creeped my brother and I out. Before we could do anything, it turned its head and looked at us. I'll never forget what I saw. The head was bald and white. Its color matched the kimono-like robe it was wearing. For some odd reason, I took note that it was wearing a stark white robe that seemed to give off a little glow. But that wasn't the creepy part. The person had turned its head so fast towards our direction and opened its mouth. The body remained still and only the head moved. That's what was really scary about it. Then, all I saw were two black holes for the eyes and an open mouth, as if it was silently screaming at us. The eyes were pure black. No pupils or whites of the eyes. Nothing. Just complete darkness where the eyes and mouth belong. Its mouth was opened so wide, it looked like a gaping hole in its face. No sound came out. It just turned its face towards us and gave us a chilling, silent scream. We were both scared shitless and took off running down the base of the hill when we ran into four of our friends. I took off first, but my brother told me that he had took a look back and saw the figure suddenly get on all fours before he started running. Our freaked out expressions put our friends on alert and we were starting to spurt out crap that there was something up the hill that didn't want to be disturbed. Ian and Jess, the two older ones, instantly took off for the top to corroborate our story. The other two just stood at the bottom and clowned my brother and I. We heard Jess call us up the hill, but my brother refused to climb back up, but ended up following me when everyone decided to head uphill. Considering the time, it probably took less than two minutes from our encounter to Jess and Ian running up the hill to look for the other person who scared the shit out of us. There's nobody here. What the hell are you guys talking about? Ian demanded as I looked around and took a quick scan of the area. Nothing. Nobody. I ran towards the other side of the hill and looked downwards. If there was someone and they went running... We would have seen them on the other side, since there was nothing on it but a road that curved and the seaside wall beyond that. There was a sidewalk on the road that led to a large baseball field in the distance, and we would have seen the person running away. I walked back to where the figure had been laying and looked at the grass. Nothing had marked where a body would have been. The grass was smooth and undisturbed. I then scoured the area on the side but the brush was thick and rather dense, so it would have been hard to just disappear into the trees and brush beyond. We looked up to the old MP station and the hidden dirt path that led up to a fenced gate. Nothing. Our friends chalked it up as something we probably made up to give them a scare, but my brother and I quietly kept our experience to ourselves. To this day, we still can't explain what we saw but we're certain that we saw a person that night. What or who they were, I still don't know, but I'm sure that they weren't normal or part of this world. The hills are still there, and my brother and I would like to go back and check out the area, but we definitely won't be doing it in the dead of night. You never know what might be lurking up in those hills. 
Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. I was pretty stoked to do this Japanese theme. I think their culture is awesome, and I'd like to go there one day. If you want me to tell your story or read a creepypasta, email me at the address in the description. Be good to animals, even people. So Yo. Whoa, you okay? What happened?